All right, I'm very happy to say Bernard Brogan is here to talk to us about his new book, Bernard Brogan, The Hill. There's the copy of it. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for Thanks coming sure. in. No, I appreciate it. Last time you were on with this, you had the full beard. You've obviously decided <laughs> that that's yeah, not I, for life, um, just yeah, for lockdown. We had, just lockdown. We had to kind of um, get back to business, get back to work, present ourselves accordingly. And uh, yeah, just got on with things. I think um, the initial COVID period, everyone kind of rallied and the energy was high. And now it's kind of trying to find that balance about life as an as norm you know and trying to get get about your business and, and get through the week you know yeah it's not it's not as much crack as we thought it might be when it was like oh this is going to be a few weeks everything's going to be grand let's have some banana bread now it's like oh jesus yeah everyone there was massive energy to start and great kind of campaigns around charity and great kind of social media content and everyone's really hyped up and then there's been several different emotions over the last few weeks and i think it's tough for people, you know. I think the schools getting back open are massive and creches and stuff like that. Um, especially my house, having the having the kids um, in school or in creche is helps us get about our day. You know? Yeah. So um, you're still still not uh, normal, but um, we're trying to get back to a bit of a bit of it. Speaking of kids, you've had the book out now. You were saying since last Monday, it's a little bit like going to a parent teacher meeting when everybody's reviewing the book. How has that ex uh, experience been like for you? Yeah, it's. Pretty positive feedback so far. Um, obviously, very nervous um, when you put out anything, and obviously a book is um, is, a, is, is a piece of work that you kind of can be very nervous about because it's, it's my story, you know what I mean? And you're waiting to hear what people think about it. Um, and I definitely, the reason I, I did it, I suppose, is that I definitely felt that my my story was different to what people maybe had a perception of me. Um, I, I worked very hard for everything that I got in sport, and, and sometimes in the media or on, on, in, in press, you, you think that I had a, had the the golden journey, even though I had here so much success. Um, but we worked hard for it, and, and, and I uh, I worked hard for for every match day I got in that blue jersey. You didn't make it as a kid, as an underage no. player at all. No, I um, obviously went to all the trials like like every aspiring um, Dublin footballer, was under fourteen, under fifteen. Myself and Ross McConnell um, coming out from Plunkett's most most years to try and represent and get a, get a nod. Ross got a bit of a, a run underage, um, but when it came to business, a uh, minor, um, both of us were were, were, were sent home. Um, I wasn't big enough. I wasn't didn't stand out enough. Um, and I actually played a little bit with the, the minor hurlers. Actually made the minor hurling team. And uh, didn't actually play in the championship. I was on the bench against Kilkenny. We were beaten in the first round. But um, yeah, I just kept at it. Um, but as I was saying, the book having Alan there, kind of just excelling, and um, probably gave me the the hunger to get after it. And um, kept with it and played, started playing some good stuff with the with the club. I got a nod. Um, I was brought in actually under Tommy Lyons in the first year. Um, Twenty ones when Alan won, Alan captained the All Ireland winning team. I was only brought in the All Ireland semi final. Um, and didn't play, was on the bench, just feeling the part. I think Tommy Lyons was, was, was gearing up to, to bring me in. Um, and then I broke down to my first cruciate, which was um, a disaster. And then obviously spent a year out. And uh, But like in, in any injury I've ever had, I always look at it and try and say, how do I become out, come better? How do I come out of this injury? With so hang on, you didn't, well, you, at 19 you were thinking that already, straight away? Yeah, well, I knew that I was small. I knew I knew what was setting set me back, and I had a chance now to, because when you're training every week, twice a week, and you're and you're playing matches the weekend, you can't find time to get after something. So I just kind of I don't know where it came across my head or whatever. I just said, oh, I need to do things a little bit differently. Um, Straight away. So when the injury happened, like cause in the book, it's clear the injury is one of the best things that ever happened to you because mm. it's a reset for everything you've ever done. Mm. And uh, like, I don't know if it's a renewal of focus or it's. This has been taken away from me. I need mm. to double down on it. Like, what do you remember? What the mindset was like? I don't know why. Yeah, I, I, I was obviously very disappointed, but I, I was quite optimistic about it. I was quite positive. Um, I don't know what, where, where I, I, I found that. Um, maybe in, in the upbringing and, and uh, playing, been around my dad so much. Um, but yeah, I looked at it and said, right, I have this. Is going to be six or seven months. Um, I was kind of in this. Started the Dublin set up. I had the best. I was down with Ray Moore, and I had been in with good physios. I had all that kind of positive environment. Um, and I talked to Barry Cattle, had just done his a couple of years pre previous, and he had um, a chat to him. And he had a kind of a, a timeline schedule that um, Trevor Giles had gave to him about his milestones that uh, no, no, no limp. Off crutches, one leg, one crutch, um, no limp, um, start to jog, full flexion, all these kind of important milestones for your recovery. And I had um, 
Trevor Giles's um, recovery times and Barry Cahill's and that was that, that was the game all he needed. I just wanted to, to do better, to get after their dates, to see where I was. So I had that kind of comparison. I think it's a real nice thing to have if anyone, sometimes it can be a lonely place and it's, a, it's kind of a never ending journey to cruise yeah. it or, or a long a shoulder or a long term injury. Um, and a lot of people don't recover from it because they don't know what they have to collect. They're told to rehab, but... What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah, you know what I mean? it's not sitting on the couch. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's a little bit of sitting on the couch, but there's also actually active stuff you can do. So you're 19 when that happens, is that 19, right? 19, yeah. yeah. Um, came through that. Um, a different... A different man. I, 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 I took a bit of a growth spurt just naturally around that time when I was 18 or 19. I was in the middle of that, and I um, went after the weights a lot. I, I, I loved the gym um, and felt that if I could bring a bit of power to my game uh, inside. I was always the small guy in the inside forward line. I said, if I bring a bit of power, I'd be able to offer something. So I hit the gym hard for um, a few months and came back a uh, different animal. We've all been watching The Last Dance over lockdown. Uh, the bit where you get rejected, uh, did that, like, was any of what Michael Jordan was like? Okay, okay. Was there a little bit of that from underage, under 15? Because, you know, famously, Henry Shefflin doesn't make it really at underage either, and always used that as like a little chip on his shoulder. Were you, were Absolutely, you, were yeah. you quietly chippy? Yeah, yeah. I always felt I had enough. I had decent self confidence, um, and I felt that I had enough football to, to add value to the team. So um, I was going to prove them wrong. I think if, <laughs> I tried to prove a lot of people wrong throughout my whole journey um, with, with Dublin's, but. Um, yeah, I, definitely, and, and as I said, having Alan there and, and seeing the dynamic that have happened of what happens on match day, and seeing like Barry Cahill and Jason Sherlock, knowing a few of the characters around, and just seeing the environment, um, I knew I wanted to be out there, um, and that, that, I, that I could get there if I if I worked hard at it. Um, it wasn't going to come naturally for me. I had to go away, and obviously, I wanted to become really accurate. Um, so I started doing a lot of practicing myself, a lot of. Um, I bought a bag of balls. My dad bought me a bag of balls. It was just one of the... Uh, In recovery from the cruciate? Yeah, yeah. So it was actually... It's your right knee, isn't that right? To my right knee, yeah. And I remember I was, I was reading something there a while ago and Paul Galvin was over in the club in London and they were asking about, well, how do you become this? How do you do that? And he said, how many of us here own a bag of footballs? Like, And they said, none of us. So how are you going to be a good footballer? Like, what you're, All you're doing is the showing up on a Thursday night for, and you probably only have... How many touches do you get in a, in a training game? You make it 30 or 40 touches of the ball. Yeah. Um, so how can you excel? So um, that was a nice, that resonated with me when I read that I read that article because I was the same. I said for me to be better, I need to get the ball in my hands. I need to be striking the ball thousands of times to get that to get that um, that pure strike and the one I wanted, you know. And so you were kicking with your left while you were recovering yeah. with the right as well, and that that's where the accuracy off the left foot comes from. Yeah, exactly. And that, that was it. Use this as an opportunity to strengthen my left foot. So I, I was actually able to do a month of just kicking off my left foot. I was out, strong enough on my right foot. I couldn't ping, I couldn't kick because obviously the cruise the lower knee. Um, so I was just striking all the ball off my left, and I was strengthening my right foot because I was obviously land, I was I was planting, sta- planting on yeah. it from my strike. Um, and yeah, like that, those that, that I kind of came away with um, strengthening my left foot and put on a bit of muscle power as well. So what year is that? God, what year was that? Um, that was two thousand and. Three, I think. And when did you make the Dublin team? That was 2004. Sorry, that was that Dublin won the All Ireland 2003. Alan's year it was that it was the end of that year. I did the cruciate and into the following year. Um, and I played a bit of under 21s with Dublin the following year. My last year 21s, we won a Leinster, um, but wasn't overly inspiring. I was just coming back from a, a cruciate injury, but I did get a, a nod. Um, to the seniors then after that. Okay, because it's that's the first part of the, the um, conversation we're going to have is the rivalry with Kerry um, because they're the team of the decade in the them and Tyrone mm. are the team of the, the decade in the noughties when um, at that stage they're playing a quality of football that you guys just can't match. What mm. was special about that Kerry team? I think they had footballers all over the park. Um, everyone was there, everyone was comfortable on the ball. Everyone was quick. Everyone was strong. Um, and they had a belief as well. I think big thing is, is having a belief you're going to get over the line. Um, and they had they just had such talent, and they 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 had guys who could score from anywhere as well. Um, so just their their breadth and even their bench and stuff like that. They had that they had that full full package back then. Yeah. One of the players who could score from anywhere, I'm delighted to say, is on the line. Mark O'Shea. Good afternoon to you. How you doing? Good, Jar. How are you? I'm good. Hey, Mark. Hey, Bernard. How are things with you? Good now. Good now. How good was Bernard, Mark? Uh, look, Bernard was Bernard for me was the he was the toughest I've ever come up against because you know it was it was uh, I was lucky enough when I started off that I didn't have to mark him the first few years because uh, he was out in the wing 
and uh, we came up against Dublin in 04, 07, 09. And uh, I think 09 was Bernard's first year there. But um, after that, then he moved in towards the corner and uh, Bernard was phenomenal. Both feet and he, uh, just listening to him there talking about the work that he did on his on his weaker weaker foot. Um, he put in serious effort. You could you could see that. And the thing about Bernard was, you could be marking him for 60, 69, 70 minutes. And if we were on top in the middle of the field, maybe the, the ball, he wasn't getting the service that, that that he would have liked. But he was just one of those players that you had to keep your eye on for the full 70, 75 minutes. I remember one of the games, it was a National League game. I think it was after Dublin beat us in 11. But uh, I was on Bernard and... It was one of those games which was actually going okay because most of the games I played against Bernard, most of them didn't go according to plan. But this game was going all right. And it was I think we were leveling, level peg, pegging coming down the stretch. And uh, a ball was kicked in anyway. And Bernard was facing in towards the, the Davin stand on the Cusick side. And again, on the left, he just took it. And he was a very clever forward insofar as that the way he made his runs he he did them. He did those lateral runs where he wasn't coming out too far. He was he was he was making the runs where he was kind of half turned. Uh, if he did receive it, you know the point was on, or maybe there was a pass on. And that game anyway, in particular, I remember the ball came in and Bernard took it, and he turned on to his right, and the ball just sailed over the bar. So it was always a t- and then I suppose when when my brother Dara retired, you know midfield was a needy area for Kerry and. When, when when Dublin were going so well, you had such such a driving force in the middle of the field, and then you were faced with the task of trying to mark him when there was a, a supply of ball coming in, and uh, it was it was tr- it was like trying to keep the tide out, trying to mark him. He was that good. But again, look, he had all the skills. He he was able to win a ball over his head. That's the big thing with a forward. The hardest forwards to mark are the fellas that can win their own dirty ball. Um, you know, kick with your with your right, kick with your left. And, you know, the big thing about him as well, and this is something that I, I really noticed about Bernard, is when, when when I had the ball and when I was coming out with the ball, the pressure he put on you when you were coming out with the ball, it was it was very hard thing to do. You knew if you were if you were bringing it into the tackle against him that you really had to hold on to that ball. So look, it was um, as I say, I was I was the unlucky uh, victim in the carry setup who had the, the unenviable task of, of trying to mark him. Um, zero, 11 was the first year, 13, uh, 13, and then there was, I think it was 15, I was injured, I tore my hamstring. Um, and again, my, the day of my birthday, <laughs> I was 36 on the, on, the, um, on the National League final, and I was Mark and Bernard, and that, that'll be a nightmare that'll, that, that's still with me this day. <laughs> but uh, no, look, he was, he was a phenomenal player, and look, to bow out at the top, what a way to, to bow out, and uh, he deserves all the plaudits. Can we go back to one of the games that you, you guys did win? It's um, the 2007 All-Ireland semi-final. It's a game that people don't really talk about that much, but actually, watching back then, uh, just this morning, I was flicking through it to kind of see, it's a really good game. You guys, like, quite close to beating that Kerry team, who go on to, to win the All-Ireland final again. Um, this is Pat O'Shea's first year, I think, in charge. How close do you guys feel you were, Bernard, to actually winning that game in retrospect? Um, well, all I can say is my experience. I was out marking um, Tommaso O'Shea, and obviously Tommaso at the height of his powers. Um, I was more chasing him back as, um, as much as going forward. Um, but we were in the game. Um, I think if you ask me honestly, did I believe we were going to get over the line? Did I have that when it came down to the, the last few minutes? Were we going to pull it out? I think that's the difference between when you have a bit of success and you don't. That intrinsic belief that. Um, the mark and the team, the, the team would have had to, to, to get over the line. There was a huge respect, um, no doubt, between um, Dublin and Kerry, uh, and Kerry took that game very seriously. But I would say inside them, they said that we bring this down to the wire, um, we we get over the line, and that maybe is maybe something that shifted. I don't know um, what Mark thinks, but um, well, because in like I, I don't know if they did respect you as much as they ultimately come to. In I later remember, years. I remember one stage, Alan. I think it was Alan or someone said that I don't know. Obviously, we we would be great pals with, with a lot of lads and 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 have been and were when we were being beaten and and, and still are when we had had a few wins over them. Um, so that relationship is 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 very respectful. I remember Alan or someone saying that um, someone maybe said something to the media about we've a lot of respect. 
respect for the, for the Dublin lads. They're lovely lads. And Alan said to me, he says, of course we're lovely lads when they're beating us every time. He says, let's see what they're like when we get over them. And in time, we, we got a few victories. But in fairness, they've been, <laughs> they've been humble that way as well. But they were always gracious winners. Um, and we, I love I loved playing, playing against the lads. Um, and Mark, he's been too kind to me there. I, I, had, I had a lot of tough times. And I ended up 70 minutes without a score most times because Mark was out in front of me. Or he he's said spoiled in the book, in the he's, your, he's your toughest marker. And that's what you said in the book. Yeah, like Mark was an ultimate footballer. He probably... Well, he wasn't wasting the full back line, but he he could have played centre forward if he wanted to. So he had he balanced like, and I just obviously watching back in 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 his last few months, writing writing the book and going through the um, the past glories and past games and, and watching especially the Open Kerry ones. And um, when you're watching Mark, I found I couldn't go. I found it very hard to go by him because he had so such balance that if it, you, usually what you try and do in size, you get the ball and you turn a man and, and power past them, but. I had to learn to kick over the shoulder with Mark because he's obviously he's a big man, um, but he, you weren't able to lose him, you know. So that's why I love playing against him because he was he was you look you're pitting yourself against the best, you know. Um, and and we had epic battles. Some Mark got the better of, and the other time I got a few scores off him, and he'd say that I got the better of him. But there was um, I always I always loved that day that day out against Kerry. Um, the, that team in the noughties, Mark, you guys must have had a lot of confidence in it, like. There was a flakiness that, that that Dublin team had been accused of having because of what happened in the Mayo game in 06 when they'd had a big lead. There was, I think it goes all the way back to Kildare scoring a couple of goals after half-time in the Leinster final just after the, was that 2000? Mm -hmm. um, so did you just automatically assume we're Kerry, we're going to win these games? And I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but like the way that the Cork hurlers would always kind of go in a couple of points up against most opponents with the collars up thinking, actually, you know, this team are going to have to put on the greatest performance they've ever done if they're going to beat us today. I, I don't think uh, there was an arrogance about us. I think that uh, I just think we had confidence in our own ability um, in the in the team that we had at the time, um, and that's you know, like even even the team that uh, Bernard was a part of in zero seven that was a that was a very good Dublin team, and the thing about it was you know, and I think it happened in twenty eleven when they made the breakthrough. That's when they started to believe. Geez, we have a, we have a serious team here. But I think that you know. With every kind of, with every year, with every game that you play, you have to have an element. Look, Stephen Cluxton will go down as the greatest goalkeeper of all times, um, one of the most influential footballers of all times. But I think Stephen made a mistake in the zero seven game. Uh, it was either the zero seven or the zero four, which 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 got us over the line really. And if Dublin had made the breakthrough that year. Maybe that was the belief that would have would have would have brought, and so maybe, maybe they'd have had more medals than what they have, you know. And they 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 have enough. I think they need to say uh, the love now was small, but but um, no, it's just I, I think what it was, and I think Bernard will agree with this. In in when you, when you go out to face an opponent uh, or face a team, you look around your your dressing room, you look what you you have. I mean, in our team at the time. You know, there was myself, there was Mike McCarthy, there was Tom O'Sullivan, there was Tomas, there was Seamus Moynihan, Aidan O'Mahony, there was Darren. Not bad. The field. <laughs> That's not a bad six, is it? Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, and I am sure if you ask Bernard, he'll say the exact same thing about the, the, the current Dublin setup in the, la in the last six or seven, eight, nine years. And then the fellas, you know, that come off the bench to finish off the game. Um, there and, and, and that's, if you look, say, back at the last the last say, you know, since 20, certainly 2013 on, that's where Dublin have had it over, Kerry, is that their, their starting 15, you know, has been has been outstanding. And then they have, the, you know, the talent that comes off the bench to come to come on and finish the job. But I don't think for a second it was, it was, it was arrogance, but what I do think happened was that you just, you have such confidence in your own team that that certainly worked a few points to you, and uh, I think I think yeah, that yeah. it's fair to say that those, those defeats are really important in terms of the long term evolution of what Dublin really become. What do, what do you remember from the start of the Earwigs game? Like how much of that do you remember? Did you ever watch it back again? No, never. <laughs> no. I just similar to to what we spoke about. It's just a, a game where that belief isn't there, and when you when you have that mindset and something doesn't go against you. Um, you can fall down, uh, a spiral down, uh, a drain very quickly, you know. Um, 
And once you get once you once you get behind, you're, you're chasing it. You're trying to force things. You're trying to put balls in to get a goal. You're trying to be, be, be sneaky instead of what, what Dublin have done over the last while, or any good team does. They stick to what they know. They, they stick to what, what works for them, and they keep going at it. And eventually, they get opportunities, like Barcelona in soccer. Well, the old Barcelona in soccer. Yeah. They kept on playing the ball, and they keep on looking for the gaps, and then they find a gap. You know what I mean? Um, and it does take that, as Mark says there, in 2011, like we probably shouldn't have won that game. Do you know what I mean? If you actually look back and said, if you played that game a thousand times, or the last ten minutes a thousand times, do we, how many times did we get over the line? A bit of brilliance from, a bit of grit, a bit of luck, and a bit of brilliance from Kev Mack, and a few good scores after that, do you know what I mean? So, yes, that tips the scales then of confidence, and, and you kind of feel, OK, now we're here, now we've done it. Even though it was only just one incident that makes a difference to, to a team of 30 people, but that, that's what it takes to win and to have that belief, and as, as Mark said, in, in the noughties when, when Kerry and throughout any decade, when, when, and, and, and they will come again, Kerry, it's about just getting that bit of belief, and to do that, you need to get win, and to, to get that win, and to get that win, you need a little bit of luck, you need, you need all of the variables to come together. Um, it's not one thing, but definitely you need, you need to get over the line um, to, to drive that confidence. It's a catch-22 situation for a lot of teams though, you can't get the confidence until you win, you can't win without the confidence. So we'll, we got into the Pat Gilroy era with your brother a little bit later on and kind of how that, mm. how that whole thing happened, but um, I do want to just talk about the, the, the defeat in, in 09 a little bit, Mark, if you can talk to us about, so that's for people who are unfamiliar with it, this is a, a Kerry team that are bedraggled, that are going nowhere, there's been rancor in the camp, they've fluked their way to Croke Park, and they're all set up for Dublin to put the, the last stake through the heart of this Kerry team and finish them off. And I think it's one ten to two points after about 15 minutes and Kerry are playing some of the best football we've ever seen. So what do you remember about that game? Uh, me, is it, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, there was a bit of controversy before the game. I think you two had a, uh, had a concert that weekend in Croke Park and Croke Park had, had a huge, uh, they were under huge pressure to lay the sod. Um, prior to the game and um, but you know I suppose we were in a situation where uh, we, we had gone through the back door nobody was giving us a chance we barely got over the line against Sligo in our backyard inside in Tralee and Austin Stack Park um, and we beat we beat Antrim above in Tullamore so we were going up to Croke Park but we just felt you know look we've nothing to lose uh, every, every everything everyone is, is backing the dubs um, and again, we, we we knew, you know what, if, if there's just something, some small little thing that will ignite it. And uh, we got a great start that day, it has to be said. Uh, up the field, Mike Mack made a great burst up the field, um, passed it to the Gooch, back at the net. And again, that kind of just ignited the season for us. It was that jolt, that kickstart that we needed. And uh, I don't think we looked back after that. But it's, it was just, look, I think that game was a kind of a, you know, you, there's games that you play that you say, Do you know what, everything just went right there and nothing went right for the opposition. That was that was one of those games. It, it The reverse happened to Kerry in 2001 against Mead, where Mead came out absolutely annihilated Kerry. Um, it doesn't make the losers a bad team. It, it didn't make Kerry a bad team in 2001. Uh, they, they, they were a bad team on the day, but you know the talent that was within that Kerry team that came back afterwards and won all Ireland's. But there's no doubt that when you lose a game like that, the the, the self reflection that you you do, the, the, you scrutinise yourself, your teammates. Um, I know from talking to Bernard and Alan that Pat Gilroy, I think he quoted you know that they looked like startled earwigs. But look, that that was that was just kind of what. You know, one of those days, and it was it was a freak. And I think everything just went right for us on the day, and it was it was what kind of got us going again. And you know, we we went on then to win the All Ireland that year. But um, you know, I, I just I don't see it as a Kerry totally dominating uh, double. It was just one of those days that everything went right, as I say. It's funny though. There was that period of, of games where you absolutely annihilate them. That day, you you had the confidence to see off their late surge in in '07 as well. From a Kerry perspective, what was different about the Dublin team that you faced in 2011 then? 2011, I suppose there was the, the, they, weren't, they were never going to lie down. They just kept going, kept going, kept going. Uh, we were four points up, I think, with 65 minutes gone on the clock. And uh, they, they just, you know, when, when, when Kevin got the goal, you know, you knew that you were, you were... Like, I remember Bernard kicked a point towards the end of that match into the 
into the hill. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they, they just weren't beaten. There was this kind of, they, they were going to go to the very end, Ger, and you just got that feeling. I remember coming out with a ball at one stage, and I think it was Kevin Nolan that came against me. And, and just the, 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 the tackling, I, I alluded to Bernard's tackling ability earlier, just they were a different they were a different animal they were they were so strong in the tackle um they were able to rip the ball so so like you know you needed that kind of a how would i say it? tomas was quite good at it breaking the line mm. you see brian driscoll doing it in the rugby he was so good at it you needed that type of a player to break the line and dublin had just had a, a wall and it was so hard to come out and and uh that was that was something that we hadn't seen from this Dublin team, where they were just they, they were a different animal that day, and they kept going to the very end. The, Bert, the, the defensive structure is almost a response in, in to what happens in the Kerry game in '09 and the the Mead game in some respects. Uh, the following year, where they they score five goals, that's the last time ever that a Dublin team has has been as open as that. Maybe with the exception of the Donegal game, we'll get to that later. But yeah, and Pat made a decision that. Um we weren't going to get there, but he'd just been nice and just been co- 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 cohorsing us into the defensive structure. He said, we need to really re- look at this, um, how to become tough to beat first and then figure out how to win, you know, and um, it's well documented the, the, the work that Pat put into um, making us work harder. Mark mentioned there about me chasing back. That's really, I, I rarely hear that, Mark, so thanks a million for um, for, for, for saying about my, my, my work rate because that was something that, Pat worked hard on something I worked hard on to be. I don't naturally have the best gas in the in, in the business, um, but I always tried to work hard. Later in my career, it was probably something I wouldn't have done in the in you know, eight or nine or seven. Whereas yeah, you chase, you, you do your best, but you're not. You, huh? You did it in sixteen as well in that national league final under the hill. I was coming out. I, I think you. I was going for a high one, and you. Uh, I was full sure I was going to catch it. And next thing, this fella came behind me and he caught it and he offloaded. I think Jim McConnelly got a goal. He was absolutely sick. I tell you, I had some nightmares after that one. <laughs> no, those are great days, Mark. What are you talking about? Um, rarely, rarely happened. But yeah, that's we just we just had to come up with something different. Um, and we drew a line in the sand. I think the start of Air Wigs is, 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 is definitely a line in the sand. The work rate that, that we put in in the early season in, in 10, um, Obviously, did um, we learned a lot from the Mead game as well, shipping five goals, and those five goals were all down to our attention to detail. Every one of them, we had someone giving out to the ref, or we had someone looking away. It was a really clear learning there after that, um, and yet we didn't quite get over the line in Cork. We were a bit unlucky. Um, we were actually moving well, and um, they they just they were a good Cork team, and they were hunting for their what, their, what they deserved, and they got over the line. Um, but after that, then I definitely think we had we had a steely resilience about our defensive structure, um, and still have, I suppose. We've got to let Mark go. Mark, thanks very much for um, for joining us. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, thanks, uh, sir. And all, all the best with the book, Bernard. Thank you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I'm going to come back to some of those um, issues that you've raised about the tackling and tackling back, and and that transformation of the team as well. A little bit later when we, we've got Alan on the line as well. But um, your own personal relationship with Kerry is, is obviously well storied at this stage. Your ma's from Kerry um, by way of Belfast, it turns out, in the book. Is that right? My granny is was Belfast, from Belfast, yeah, right. who, um, who her, da- her, her dad passed away. He worked in Harlan Wolf, and uh, the kids were shipped off around Ireland to the different um, uh, relations. And my granny was sent down to Kerry to her aunt and uh, Mary James, Jamesy, my granddad, and uh, yes, yeah, so my mum was reared in Listowel in the main street, um, down from John B. Keynes and Kennelly's above that, and I think there was 50 bars in, 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 uh, in, in Listowel and a population of 3,000 at the time or something <laughs> like that, like I don't know how, they used to flood in for the races I suppose, but um, great, great town, great, great characters, like, you, you, like just, like, Big into the arts. My granny was big into the arts, and John B. So it's it's, it's like it's like a, a play every time you go into the place. You go down to the pubs and the, and the characters telling stories at the bar and singing and saying poems and all that. It's a, it's a beautiful place. Yeah, like that hinterland that you had then meant that there was an escape from the the pressure bubble of being a double footballer in the middle of all this. Or is that true? Like I don't know. It, cause we, we we always heard a lot that there was a, a lot of pressure on the dubs in the middle of uh, a season and. Any time anybody would bump into anybody who was involved, there didn't seem to be that much. They all seemed to be quite well balanced to be able yeah. to deal with us. We were, we were well protected, in fairness. Um, James McCormack in the media, as you know, was, um, had us well, w- w- well drilled and, and it worked. You know, Jim was here, attention to detail, even Pat before him. 
they wanted to protect the players. Um, there was a big circus at times, um, and we tried to protect ourselves from that. As um, stop reading papers around the games, don't be reading your reviews. I remember Paul Carrington talking to us and saying that even reading your, your positive reviews is more damaging than your negative ones. At least the negative ones, it gives you a bit of hurt and gives you a bit of drive. The positive reviews um, in, in inflate you to a level where you just fall off a cliff, you know, that when, when things go wrong and somebody calls you out then, um, I took a lot from that. Um, in my early days, like anyone, you kind of, oh, you're looking for the, the, do they play well, what do you think? Or, yeah. You're looking for that positive affirmation that things are going well. And I judge myself on, did I score five points or seven points or one six? I mean, on, sc on scores and, and, and credit has been a success metric, whereas as I got a bit more mature and um, understood the, the dynamic of a team, basically about working hard and success being about working for the team, getting a turnover, um, making up for someone else who slipped and, and, and trying to get a tackle in or laying off a goal or I loved I loved assisting a goal at, with back to goal at full forward and somebody on the burst like that I nearly got more joy out of that than putting the ball in the back of the net It wasn't like that when you got into the Dublin team though it wasn't like that from the Dublin team beforehand you, you quote um, in the book Keith Barr saying his uh, three best friends when he was playing for Dublin were Keith Barr Keith Barr and Keith Barr which is the most Keith Barr quote of all time <laughs> <laughs> but like that was kind of there was a bit of that heritage still there even when you got into the team at the start like and that maturity wasn't just you there was a there was a bang of spice boys a little bit off that Dublin team they were going to play great football they were going to pull it up to everybody they'd be there for the scrap but ultimately at the end the opposition were going to be winning in the big games and yeah in some way um, and the players probably believed that it was self fulfilling um, prophecy that 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 kind of yeah we'll get out we'll win some games we'll, we'll head off in a beer for a couple of days and uh, and we'll be nearly men at the end and we'll have a, have a good year and we'll go again and we'll go away for the weekend to Spain for on the, on the beer and not that it was beer or anything like that but it was just there was a little bit of that because the lifestyle know, wasn't about winning it was about the lifestyle that, yeah yeah, and it's about like as you say the, not being protected in that bubble like buying into as when you're walking down the street and someone's talking about the dubs and we're great stuff and you're flying it and stuff like that whereas um as the later we went on, the more we were protected from that, and we and we were we were communicated this this is not helping you. you know what I mean, this is not like, is are you here to get to an All Ireland quarter final and go out on your ass and um, and go play golf for a couple of days and drink a few points? Like, is that why what it's about to be Dublin and a lot of the team? No one obviously wanted that, but when you actually look back at the I and mean, we tapped into our legacy and look at the seventies and look at how Dublin over the years we've only had one all Ireland each decade up there with 83 with 95 coming into the, t the, the, the thousands then like I mean we, we were we were a failure as a Dublin team you know what I mean and when we got it between the eyes a couple of times you start to you start to um, cop onto yourself a bit you know um, so we we had to learn the hard way in that way and um, we had great fun through, throughout the noughties we had some great great days we, we had great characters on the pitch um, great characters in the dressing room Um but as time went on, um, when definitely when Pat came in, he 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 drew a line in the sand, and they say in the book there, the closer you were to the back of the bus, um, the more danger you were to be off the bus, kind of thing, you know. Um, yeah. Where he wanted certain types of like types of individual individuals that were uh, that were going to go for, go like a train through the wall for um, for Dublin and act and, and behave in, in accordingly. Not that the lads weren't acting in, in, in a decent way, but um, just things were changing. Yeah, well, we'll get to the change in, in a little while. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking with uh, Bernard Brogan. His book is called The Hill, and it's in all good bookshops now.